Hey, good morning, Forward Church. Hey, I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much uh, for your faithful giving throughout the last year. We are coming into the end of our fiscal year, so our fiscal year ends at the end of June. So I wanted to say thank you. Just wanted to kind of give you a quick update of where we are. We are, uh, with this week, there's seven weeks left, and we are running about $390,000 to make our budget this year. So just ask you to prayerfully consider how God might be prompting you to give and uh, I'll leave that between you and the Lord. Also, super excited this morning uh, to welcome some new members. I, I was just, we were talking with our board this week uh, at our elders board meeting. We have had just a huge influx of people uh, applying for and wanting to become and becoming members. It's so exciting to see what God is doing. So this morning, welcoming Sam and Maria Ara and uh, Diane Baldoviano into membership. And so uh, let's just give them a round of applause. And if, if you consider Forward Church your home church, I would encourage you to consider membership. We would love to talk to you more about membership. Pastor Kirk, myself, will be out there in the lobby after church today. We'd be happy to talk to you about how you can enter into that process. Turn to Exodus chapter 17, and we've been covering big chunks over the last while in Exodus. Today, we're going to keep it contained to eight verses, the first eight verses of Exodus chapter 17. As you flip over there, I want you to think about this. What if I told you that there was something that you could do that would improve your immune system? It would lower your chance of heart disease. It could ease symptoms of anxiety and depression. It could improve your relationship with others. In fact, I would argue this is one of the very best things that you could put into practice that would strengthen any relationship with you, that you're in, but especially a marriage relationship that would improve your sleep. Like how many of you would like to sleep a little bit better? It would increase your grit so that when difficult times come, you have the ability to kind of push through and persevere through. What if, what if I told you there was something you could do that would do all those things? It doesn't involve having you to eat any kale. You don't have to convince yourself and lie to yourself that jogging is actually a thing that you like to do. And it's not gonna cost you a single dollar of money. Is that something you might be interested in? This is where I get into the sales. I used to do a little bit of sales. This is my sales pitch to you. And it, on the flip side, what if I told you right now there is an activity that you participate in on average 15 to 20 times a day that is actually compromising your immune system? It is making you more susceptible to high cholesterol, and to diabetes, it, it is physically shrinking your brain. It is decreasing your ability to solve problems and to figure out solutions. It increases the likelihood that you are going to struggle with anxiety and depression, and it actively works to deteriorate relationships that you have and push people away from you. Would you like to swap those two things? Because activity one is gratitude, and activity two is grumbling. Now, I'm just gonna speak for me for a second. For me, here's what I know about me. Grumbling is instinctual almost, but gratitude requires a little bit of intentionality. See, I default into grumbling and I have to discipline myself to gratitude. And, and last week, as we continued on in our journey through Exodus, we saw the people of Israel who, remember, they have now escaped their oppressors. They have, they have achieved freedom. They've crossed the Red Sea, but they haven't, gotten to the promised land, right? They haven't gotten to the land full of milk and honey. No, they're in the desert right now. There is 
millions of people right now wandering in the desert as we are in this point in Exodus. And as we talked about last week, in case you're unaware, deserts lack two things that are fairly critical for human life, water and food. And if you lead any size group of people, I don't care how big the group of people, it's you and somebody else, maybe it's just you that you're leading, and there's no food and there's no water, there's unhappy people really quickly. And what, we were, what we're gonna see this week is that Israel has entered into this cycle now of complaining and grumbling as they deal with the stresses and strains of desert life, of the time in between being saved and coming to the promised land of rest. And, and what we're also gonna see in here is that there actually is a cure, because I said this last week at the end, this is the space in which we live as Christians. We have received salvation, but we have not gotten to the land of promised rest, right? Like that's the new heaven and new earth, that's presence of God, that's where we're headed, but we live in this in-between where we live in scarcity, and so how do we deal with that scarcity without falling into, defaulting into our instinct of grumbling? And here's our big idea for this morning, that there is a cure, and grace is the cure to grumbling and the secret to gratitude. So I just wanna pray for us as we enter into this text that God would reveal himself to us this morning. Father, through your spirit, would you move and work? Would you help us to hear what you want us to hear? I believe every single person is here today by divine appointment. They may not even have known they were gonna show up here today when they woke up. They may not have known they were gonna turn on a video feed, but that you have them here for a purpose today. So God, would you speak through your word and would you work through us with through your spirit and lead us into how you would want to encourage us, challenge us, strengthen us, grow us today, we pray. Amen. All right, let's read this passage all together and then we'll break it down. So starting in verse one. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. That is not that they're actually leaving the wilderness. They're actually moving deeper into it, but they're moving through the wilderness. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Again, this is not the same story told over again. This is a new spot where they find themselves again with no water. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? And why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. The people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And so Moses cried to the Lord, what? shall I do with this people? They are, all re- they are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? As we get into this, there's an important distinction I want to make right out of the shoot, and that's that there is a difference between lament and grumbling. See, there's a danger when we start to talk about complaining and we start to examine our hearts when it comes to complaining that we start to hear that we should never express ourselves to God. That we shouldn't come to him when we're struggling. That we shouldn't come to him when we're frustrated. Uh, Last weekend, I was with my sister and my sister uh, works for a, uh, Thames Valley School Board. And she said, hey, have you heard what's going on? Did you see a video of what happened at the last Thames Valley School Board meeting? 
I said, no. And she said, oh, let me show you this video. And so there's a video of the mayor of Zora Township, and he came in to express some displeasure in the governance of the board. And he just started to get into his complaint when one of the trustees interrupted him and said, um, I just need to let you know, this is a criticism-free zone. We only allow positive comments here. Now, if you're interested in going to watch that and you want to have all sorts of terror about the state of our school boards, feel free. Uh, April 26th, it's the Thames Valley School Board meeting. It's online. You can check it out. But there is a real difficulty here that the people of Israel are facing, right? It says right in verse 1, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. That means God's brought them there, but there was no water for the people to drink. That's real. Like that, that is serious. That is difficult. It, it, again, it's not like God is not aware of the reality. He brought them there. And it's not like God is too fragile to deal with the people pointing out the difficult circumstances they find themselves in. God, God can handle when we come to him and say, God, I am struggling. God, I'm hurting. God, this situation is a mess. God, that thing that happened to me, that thing that happened to that person is unjust, and we bring that to him. If, you, if you're in your Bibles, turn over quickly to Psalm 13. We want to read to you a song of lament. The psalmist writes, he says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Anybody feel like that this morning? Maybe that's the spot you're in today. You just feel the weight and the brokenness and the pressure of this world. And then he cries out, he says, look on me and answer, Lord my God. I'm desperate, I need you. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. God, if you don't show up, I'm done for. And my enemy will then say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Now here's what I would say. If the psalmist stops at this point, we are, we are not far apart from the complaint of the people of Israel, right? Like, that is not far from, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? There's, a, there, there's an angst, there's a reality of living in a broken world that God invites us to bring to him. In both of these situations, there's a legitimate struggle and pain that is going on. There is groaning that is going on. And yet one is given, us, given to us as scripture to say, here's how you can speak your hurt and your disappointment to God and allow him to meet you in that. And the other one is sin. Did you hear me on that? Did you recognize that grumbling is a sin? Philippians 2.14 Apostle Paul states it pretty bluntly. He says, do all things without grumbling or arguing. You can bring that up with your kids the next time. But, so what's the difference here? What's the difference between what the psalmist is doing and what the people of Israel are doing? The difference is not so much in the place where they start. It's not so much in the circumstance that they start in. It's the place where they finish as they come to God. See, the psalmist doesn't end there. He goes on in verses five and six, he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. He says, in spite of what is in front of me, in spite of what I am facing, I choose trust. That no matter how bleak the circumstances are that I find myself in, there is a bigger picture that ends in my salvation. In spite of my hurt and my heartache and my heartbreak, 
I will not slander God in this moment. Instead, I will choose to praise him, right? For he has been good to me. Without the ability to recall God's goodness, to, to, to recall his grace, if we don't have that to anchor our hearts to when we face the difficulty of this world, we will fall into grumbling. You say, well, I mean, I complain sometimes, 15 to 20 sounds about right. At least the ones that I vocalize. But why does God care about my grumbling? Like, what does it matter to him when I grumble about the traffic and grumble about kids these days and, you know, just be a normal Canadian and complain that it's too hot in the summer and it's too cold in the winter? Why does God care that I was cussing out the, the referees under my breath last night and that I'm a Leafs fan. <laughs> it's beyond the fact that God actually cares about you and, and he knows the devastating consequences of living a life of grumbling rather than gratitude. We, we covered those practically in the intro there's a deeper principle that we need to see here, and that's that all grumbling is ultimately grumbling against God. And if you don't believe me, just, just go back a chapter to where we were last week, Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3, and then I'm going to jump down to 8. So verses 2 and 3, just to refresh your memory, <laughs> the people of Israel didn't have water, they got water, then they didn't have food, and so God brings them in, and so this is the complaint about not having food. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Moses, if we skip down, also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. See, they phrased it against Moses, but Moses says, your grumbling wasn't against me, it was against him. Because then he says, who are we? You're not grumbling against us but against the Lord. Not sure if you've noticed this or not, but we have an election coming up. And if there's one thing that Canadians like to grumble more about than the weather, it's about politicians. And so I, I wanna give you uh, just a little bit of a pep talk here. First of all, you and I have been incredibly blessed with the opportunity to vote. And I would charge to you as followers of Jesus who recognize that blessing that you should take the opportunity to use that right to vote. That means you have the responsibility to read over the platforms of various parties, to engage with local representatives who will be coming around your door to try and secure your vote, to listen into debates if you're able to. And then, most importantly, prayerfully take it to the Lord and cast a ballot for who you feel the Lord is leading you to vote for. There is no party that is the Jesus party. There is no party whose platform will perfectly represent what it looks like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and then perfectly encapsulates all of the ethic of Christianity. But do what you can according to your conscience and the way the Lord leads you to vote. Most of us, no matter who gets voted in, over these next four years, will find ourselves unhappy in some way or another. And we are going to be tempted to grumble. 
let me remind you what God's word says about the nature of those who take positions of authority in our governments. Daniel 2, 21 says, he, that is God, changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So you vote, but God will do what he will do. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So here's what don't grumble, I think, means for us as Christians who live in a parliamentary democracy. Don't grumble doesn't mean that we can't cry out to God when leaders do we th things that we think are unjust or unrighteous. I think God would call us to cry out to him. And what better place to turn than to the one who can take down kings and place in kings? Because you and I, we can't do much, but God can do anything. It doesn't mean that we can't hold leaders to account when they are acting in ungodly ways, when they break their promises. Again, that's part of what it means to exercise our right to vote. But it means that we have an ultimate posture that looks like this. It looks like, God, although I disagree with the decisions of the people who lead us, I recognize that they are people created in the image of God whom you sent your son to die for and I will pray for them. And I won't just pray that you will remove them from office, although that might be part of what you ultimately pray. I will pray that they come to know you and know your salvation and your blessing and your goodness in their life. God, even, even though I dislike the direction that the government seems to be taking us. Even though I personally am being afflicted and affected by the direction that a government is taking us, I don't fear it because I know you're ultimately the one who's in control. And so whatever comes to me comes through your hands and you're a good father and I can trust you. See, we pray Knowing that God is good, that he is a, a good God who is at work for his good and our good in all, in all things. That is a very different posture than a posture of grumbling which says, oh, our premier is the worst. Our prime minister is terrible. I can't believe fill in the blank was so dumb that they voted for them. See, we are to be a people who don't grumble, but who trust. And grumbling ultimately comes from a failure to trust and a sense of entitlement. Why did the people grumble? Well, the first reason people grumbled was because the people felt that God had got it wrong. Think back to last week. Think back to... The first story that we looked at, the water of Merah, it was not just the water that had gotten bitter, it was the people who were bitter. God had taken them into the desert, right? We talked about this. There was no water for three days. And finally, on the horizon, water appears and they run out and they get to that water and they go to put the water into their mouths. They go to uh, bring their, their livestock to get them to the water. And it was undrinkable. And they grumbled. And I think all of us should have a lot of empathy towards that. Because I can't imagine there's any of us in this room who haven't been there before. Where we come to a point and we think, Things are not going according to plan, which ultimately means, right, things are not going according to my plan. I want you to see something here. Complaining often comes with two frequent, frequent traveling partners. Bitterness and worry. I love this quote from Tim Keller. Tim Keller says, worry is not believing God will get it right, and bitterness is believing that God got it wrong. Right? They were bitter because they thought God had got it wrong. He'd taken them to water and the water wasn't even drinkable. What is God doing? If you're a worrier or if you struggle with bitterness, if you struggle with 
just constantly worrying that God's not going to get it right or you are focused on the fact that your plan didn't happen and God must have got it wrong, I can almost guarantee that you are a grumbler because those things travel together. And because they all stem ultimately out of a lack of trust. That's why they travel together. Your root issue, if you worry, your root issue, if you're bitter, your root issue, if you complain, is you lack trust. Those are just the symptoms. The soil of a grumbling spirit is made up of two elements, and the first is a lack of trust. The second element of the soil is a sense of entitlement. See, the second reason that they were grumbling is because they didn't think what they were experiencing is what they should experience. They didn't think it's what they deserved. Unspoken behind every single grumble is the phrase, I don't deserve this. This should not have happened to me. And I'm going to say this, and I know, I know how hard this statement lands in the culture we find ourselves in. So I want you to know, I'm saying this out of love to you. And I, and I hope you'll receive it this way. You and I should thank God every moment of every day that we don't receive what we deserve. Like, you and I, are sinners. And if you don't think that's true, can I encourage you to kind of track with us for a couple more weeks? We're going to get to the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to walk you through a test that should lay it out pretty clear. And sin, by its very nature, earns and deserves death. And like I said, I'm just going to keep on hammering this home. I know I've said this a bunch, but I also know the culture that we are saturated and the, the, bre- the air that we breathe says you deserve, you are entitled, it's your right. It is so antithetical to what scripture teaches us. Because scripture teaches us that it is the kindness of God. It is the mercy of God that any of us are in this room or watching online today. It is only the kindness of God that we breathe another breath And getting this is so important because the grace of God has the power to turn our grumbling into gratitude. There's an incredible picture that is given to us in this passage this morning that I'll just be honest, I had, as many times as I've read through this, I had never seen this picture until I was studying this week. So let me read it for you and unpack it for you. So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And listen to what the Lord says, and then then I'm going to just kind of help you picture this. The Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Okay, so it's going to be elders of Israel over here. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. So Moses is going to stand over here with the staff that struck the Nile. Just want you to keep these locked in your head. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. Okay, so God's standing in front of the rock. And you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now here's what has happened through the people's grumbling. When we grumble, we put God on trial. Right? We we are blaming God for something. And so they have put God on trial. So what God is doing is he's arranging the courtroom. The representatives of Israel are going to be on one side. That's the elders of Israel. They're going to be on one side. And then God says, I will stand before you at the rock at Horeb. And so God is on the other side. So this is the case of Israel versus God. In the middle is Moses with his staff, and we got a little bit of detail there, right? What staff is it? It's the staff with which Moses struck the Nile. What was he doing when he was striking the Nile? He was proclaiming judgment on the people of Egypt. And so 
Moses is to act as the judge with the staff of judgment in his hand. And all of this is going to take place in front of the people. So the community, the congregation, they are the public witness so that everyone can see what happens. Now, if this were a legitimate trial, like if this were a trial that was going to have a true outcome, the Israelites are guilty and deserving to be condemned. God is innocent and deserves to be vindicated. But what does God say to Moses? He says, strike the rock. Where was God standing? Where the rock was standing. See, God is saying to bring down the rod of judgment on himself. He takes the judgment that his people deserve And as a result, the blessings of water flow out through him out of the rock. Some of you are probably a little skeptical. You're like, hmm, seems like you're reading into this. I thought you might say that, so let me just take you to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 10.4. He's describing the situation of the people of Israel in their desert wanderings. He comes to this moment. And he says, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. See, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of what will take place that day, right? He is the one who suffered injustice on his behalf. He took our condemnation. He died our death so that we could live and receive his vindication. And because of that, Ephesians 1.3 says, we are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing if we have placed our faith in him. Let me ask you something. When you have everything, how do you complain about anything? Like if Elon Musk... You bump into Elon, Burger King over here. Elon starts complaining to you that it's taken too long for his order. How much sympathy do you have for Elon Musk in that moment? He starts whining to you about his life. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The only way that it is possible to give thanks in all circumstances is that in Christ, if you are in Christ, no matter the circumstance, you are blessed beyond measure. Because in Christ, all spiritual blessings are yours. Let me just kind of bring this to a conclusion. It says, he called the name of the place Massa, that means testing or temptation, And Meribah, that means quarreling or protest. And then he lays that out. Because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord. How did they test the Lord? They tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Some of you are grumbling today because you're wondering, is God with me or not? Like, how could he let this happen? If the Lord is with me, why am I going through this? I want to remind you, if that's the place that you're at, the last words of Jesus before he ascended in Matthew 28, 20, where he promised to his people, those of us who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, I will never leave you or forsake you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how rough it is. I don't know how tough it is, but I know this. Jesus promised he will never leave you or forsake you. He's there with you in it. So let me ask you, have you experienced the grace of God in your life? If you're a Christian, you need to reflect on the grace of God in your life. Frequently, constantly. Like if you've trusted in Jesus as your savior, 
Think of what you have received. You've received his gracious forgiveness. You've received his adoption into his family. You've received his full and complete acceptance through Christ. You've received the promise of life to the full, yes, now, but also life eternal. Like all of that is graciously yours through Christ and there is no circumstance, there is no injustice that you will face, there is nothing that will come into your life that can rob you of those things. So in a second here, I'm just gonna invite you to confess and to repent and to reflect on the goodness of God. But if you're not a Christian, if you haven't yet come to a point where you've placed your faith in Christ, I just want to speak to you for a second. The grace of God to you is that although you deserve death, God sent his son Jesus to die for you so that you could have life. There is no greater act of kindness that anyone could ever perform for you. His grace is bigger than all your failures. His grace is more comprehensive than your sin. His grace is enough to cover over and erase all of your shame. See, Jesus is the ultimate rock that was struck on the cross. He took the punishment that you deserved and offered up life and blessing instead to you. And I, I just encourage you, like, if you're struggling with knowing this, don't leave this place until you have talked to someone to have assurance that this is true for you. We'd love to talk with you and, and, and share with you how you can know with absolute certainty that God's grace is sufficient for you. Like I said, for those of us who are Christians, I'm gonna invite us to come together now around the Lord's table, around communion. 1 Corinthians 11. Paul recounts that moment in the upper room and he said that Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks, saying, this is my body, to do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way it says he, he took the cup, and the cup Christ said, is the new covenant poured out in his blood. And whenever we take this bread and drink this cup, we do this in remembrance of him until he comes again. When we remember this morning, here's what I would like us to do. Just bow your heads for a second. And I want you to just reflect on his goodness to you. I want you to think about a moment from this past week where God has shown his grace to you. If you're drawing a blank, know that every time you walked out the door and felt the warmth of the sun on your face this week, that was the grace of God to you. Every time you looked at the new blooms of spring and saw the beauty of the world that he's created, that's God's grace to you. is good. He's gracious. I want you to stop and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you've had a grumbling heart this week. It could be at work. Maybe you grumbled at your kids or your spouse. It could have been a really legitimate season and reason that you are grumbling. You may have experienced real injustice and pain and hurt this week. But instead of blaming God, God invites you to come to bring it to him and to entrust it into his hands as a God who is good and gracious to you and who has been good and gracious to you and trust him in the outcomes because here's the big picture if you're in Christ. The big picture is Christ is on the throne. Satan is defeated. And someday, 
you will experience all of eternity in paradise with him in a new heaven and new earth where everything is reconstructed to be just as it ought to be. Let me pray for these elements. Father, we thank you for the bread represents your body broken for us. And as we picture this picture of Moses striking the staff on the rock, I picture the body of Christ laid out and taking the lashes. His body placed over my body, receiving the lashes that I deserve. And then his arms outstretched, nailed to the cross, blood flowing, the blood that should be my blood flowing the cup that represents the forgiveness and the new covenant. Not a covenant of striving and working and earning, but a covenant of grace. So God, as we come and we take these elements, would you renew our hearts? We have hearts overflowing with gratitude because what else can we do when we see the goodness and the totality of your grace to us except to be people of gratitude who praise you. And Lord, forgive us for all the times we so easily default into a sinful heart of grumbling. Help to make us a people of grace and gratitude, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's take the bread together. Christ's body broken for you, his grace upon you. same way we'll take the cup representing Christ's blood poured out the forgiveness of our sins nothing but grace take and drink now let's praise our God and glorious Savior together